Hello, my name is Kent Daniels, and Zach Blankenship will help us um, interview Mr. Brooks Godwin, who is a veteran of World War II. Mr. Brooks, how about give us your full name? My full name is Zola, Z-O-L-A, Brooke, B-R-O-O-K-E, Godwin, G-O-D-W-I-N. And when were you born? October the 14th, 1925. And how old are you right now? I am 93 and I'll be 94 in a, about three months. All right, how about tell us about your early childhood? My early childhood was uh, on a, on a, in a country setting, naturally. I think most settings back then would be classified as country. And I, I lived, and it was, I was born on North Church Street, right off North Church Street, opposite Godwin Store. At the age of six, I moved about a half a mile down McCutcheon Road to a farm that my father bought. And that's where I used to walk from to go to school. The grammar school was located just across the swamp from us or the lake. Now tell us about going to school. Well, <clears throat> I, I do remember Mr. Whitehead and Mr. Truluck, because they gave me my first paddle. <laughs> of course, there was some better things that happened to me. I got to meet a lot of new people. Believe it or not, back in those days, I probably didn't travel from one side of Lake City to the other. So I had no idea who lived and school brought in an awakening that there were quite a few other people just like me. Who was um, one of your best friends? Well, I had several. I, I liked Donald Jones back in those days. <laughs> he, uh, and there was Charles Dennis, Melvin Levine, uh, what did you do to have fun? Mostly something that you would, you would come up with yourself or, or one of the others that would always get you in trouble sooner or later. <laughs> we, would, we had a bicycle. I remember they dug a, a new canal through the country and while it was nice and clean, we used to ride the bicycles up and down it. Also, uh, we, used to, we used to get in the watermelon patches around the countryside. All kinds of things like that. Uh, who was your father and mother? My father was Zola Clyde Godwin. My mother was... Many Bell Fountain Godwin. And what did they, what kind of occupation were they? Farming. He also was a part time uh, electrician and he was also a part time barber. He had, he had actually had his own barber shop at one time. How about your siblings, your brothers and your sisters? How many did you have? I have nine siblings. Nine siblings. There's three still living, including myself. No, four. I'm sorry, four. Four still living. And what rank are you in, in your family? I'm number four. I'm number four. Just a few days ago, we lost my oldest brother, 
And at that time, I believe he would have been the oldest male member of the Godwin family that ever reached 98 years of age. I also have a sister, older sister, 97, an older sister, 95, and a younger, the youngest, number nine, I don't recall his age. Were y'all a close family? Had to be. Had to be. Okay, what kind of prop, crops did y'all um, have? The main cash crop was tobacco uh, because that was the most staple probably in the area. But we did corn and cotton, peas, beans, truck crop, cucumber, squash, stuff like that. What did you do to have fun with your family? Well, our family usually got together several times during the year, special, special occasions like uh, Easter egg hunting. Now, that was one of our favorites. But there was, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving. My father used to cook uh, stew, some type of chicken stew. I, I can't think of the name of it. But he cooked stuff like that and invited the whole family in. And uh, that was, we enjoyed those occasions. Sometimes we went fishing together. Sometimes we went on trips, short trips, very short trips, let's put it that way. Where did you go? Well, one time we actually went all the way to Goldsboro, North Carolina, and that was the longest trip I think we ever made. Or the longest trip I ever made. But we would we like to go to the county fair. There wasn't, there wasn't a lot of occasions like that when you got through with all the farm work. What kind of games did y'all play? Well, we, we liked to play uh, baseball, and uh, we liked to play, uh, you know, word games. Hop, oh, hopscotch was, was one of the main games you liked to play back then. Um, do you remember anything about the Depression? Yes, yes. I do remember about the Depression. Now, how was it in Lake City? Well, I think it was just like anywhere else. You know, no jobs, pay very light. I remember when the WPA, when President Roosevelt came in office in 1932, and he started the Work Progress Administration that gave jobs to a lot of people. My father uh, dug ditches and drainage, worked on drainage type jobs that the government would sponsor. And the pay was $2.50 a week, digging ditches. Okay. Uh, do you remember far, the um, far, far side chats that Roosevelt used to have? Yes, yes, we used to get around the radio and try to get a pick, uh, try to get it to come in, you know, where you could understand it. How about uh, your favorite show on the radio? Well, Amos, Amos and Andy was uh, probably one of the tops. And what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 19, in the class of 1942-43. Okay, and you mentioned some of your best friends during high school years, who were they? I, I think uh, most all the uh, class, we were very, very good friends. How many did you have in your graduating class? Oh, I can't remember that. Okay. I, I have no idea. Were you an academic? Or were you uh, um, 
of I, athletic. I wasn't, I wasn't an academic. You more or less uh, um, an athlete? No, I wasn't an athlete either. When you work on a farm, you don't have much time for it. Okay. How about football games and baseball games? Well, occasionally I got to go to one, yes. But, uh, and, the, and the school, I think our school had a, a fairly strong uh, baseball and football and basketball team at that time. Now, who were some of your fondest teachers? I think uh, the, the, the women teachers were very good. And one of the male teachers that I liked very much was uh, Mr. Schuster, Fritz Schuster. And of course, Ms. Gravely, I like Ms. Gravely. And I, I particularly like the lady that taught typing. I thought she was great. Um, what kind of jobs did you have? Did you have a job outside the farm? Yes, I used to work at the drugstore uh, on Saturdays. Now, where was the drugstore? The one, the one that I worked at most was uh, Roper. It, it ended up being Roper Drug. I don't recall who had it before him. What type of music did you enjoy? I guess just hillbilly style. Of course, I, I did like the, uh, the marching bands. And uh, we used to have those occasionally. Okay. When we'd have uh, something at school like, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of it now. But it would invite all the schools in the entire neighborhood it was in field competition. Day, wasn't it? Fields Day, yes. And usually they'd have a, a band that would play a lot of music. Do you remember Pearl Harbor, the day the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Yes. Well, what were you doing that day? I don't recall. Okay. I don't recall. Okay. Um, the time you graduated until you joined the service, what did you do? I finished out that year on the farm, and then I worked with W. Lee Flowers Company in the uh, early winter until I was inducted into the service. Now, when did you, when was that? My induction date was uh, January the 2nd, 1944. Mr. Brooks, you were 18 years old and you were inducted January 2nd, 1944, right? Right. What were you doing during the induction? Well, uh, working with uh, W. Lee Flowers, driving a truck, covering probably seven counties, different places. When you were inducted, were you drafted? I was drafted, yes. Where were you drafted or inducted to? I was inducted at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. What branch of the military were you drafted to? Infantry. Army, Army Infantry. Was there any special schooling you had to go to? None that I know of. What was a normal day in the life of the infantry? Like training day? Training days, always a lot of marching to and fro, a lot of exercises physically, always dealing with uh, weapons, especially your, your, your rifle. What was your rifle of specialty? M1. Do you remember when you were shipped overseas? Yes. How were you shipped? Well, I went over on the Queen Mary. Now, as you know, the Queen Mary was a luxury liner, probably in the 80,000 ton range, one of the largest ships afloat. 
And I was lucky enough to get to go across the ocean in the Queen Mary, and I was very, very happy about that. Was this your first time on a ship? Uh, yes. Yes, it was the first time. How do you feel about being on the Queen Marion? Oh, I felt good about it. I felt good about it. It looked tall in port, very tall. But once it got out in the ocean, it, it wasn't quite as tall. Okay. One of the things that happened after we got boarded up and left the harbor in New York City is they announced after the ship got out into the ocean that we would be picking up a passenger off Newfoundland, Winston Churchill. Did you know who he was at the time? Oh, yes. Yes, I'd heard him speak many times. He always said, England shall never surrender. <laughs> did you ever get to meet Mr. Churchill? No, I did not. I did not ever get to meet him. I listened to him. He talked to us on the boat over the speaker system. And of course, the ship was loaded probably with 15,000 troops. And there was no special occasions for that. So after the Queen Mary docks, and did it dock in England? It... Uh, the docking part, we went into Scotland, Glasgow, Scotland. And there the ship, there was no dock for the ship of that size. So it, there was quite a large lake in there or a lagoon or sea, a small sea. And they took you by a smaller boat to the railroad station. So they took you to the railroad. Did they take, did they uh, ship you by train anywhere else? Yes, there's, there's, I don't recall what the name of the place was. I don't even know if it had a name, but it was just Quonset, metal Quonset huts. And I'd never been around a Quonset hut before. I remember the beds. The bedstead was made out of two by fours with a piece of wire, like a uh, hog wire stretched across it. And then they'd use a mattress cover and fill it with straw. And that was your, that was your bed. How long did you stay there? We were quarantined for the first 30 days and I believe I was there close to 60 days. I'd have to backtrack a little bit on that. Okay. So you're there at the huts for about 60 days. Mm -hmm. And then did they ship you anywhere else? Oh, yes. Where'd you end yes. up going? Well, we actually, you know, trained in that area too. And we even had a jump. We even had a practice jump. But after that, they shipped us to France. We went by C-47, the same airplane that we jump out of. We, uh, we couldn't make it across the first time, across the English Channel. The weather was so bad, and people were throwing up, and so they turned around and went back, and it took about a week before the weather got straight. And the next time, we got across okay. And we went to a French camp, and it was called Camp Marmelon Le Grand. Uh, it was west of Paris, going toward Germany. Uh, I don't know exactly how far from Paris, but that's where we went to. And the, I, I do remember that the year, it was around, 
somewhere around the 1st of December of 44. Because the 101st Airborne had just returned from the Holland jump, which was the second jump that it had made, Normandy being first, and then the Holland jump. And they stayed in this position for something like 60 days, which is very, very unusual. And they were, they were brought back to Mormon Le Grand to be uh, replenished. When I say replenished, replacements like me. Do you know any of your uh, commanders, like any officers that were above you? Uh, I, I can always remember the Brigadier General who was in charge of the division at the time. And his famous words were nuts, N-U-T-S. Oh, apostrophe. Did, <laughs> well, did that ha did that Brigadier General have to be uh, Brigadier General McAuliffe? McAuliffe. Yes. Okay. So as you're getting replenished and you're at the camp, did you happen to go anywhere else? No. Our 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 mission was to jump across the Rhine. Okay. And. The Germans started this offensive, and Eisenhower and the other staff members had to pull in all the troops who weren't in a fighting position to stem that battle or to stem that drive. And so we went in without knowing uh, our next known uh, next door bunk bunk without your bunk mate bunk mate yeah yeah we didn't have time to pick up on any social so that we'd have names in fact I never I never knew the name of my squad leader Things move very fast, yeah. and very and part and a lot of the the uh, division had been given leave, and were off at Paris and other places. They didn't even have time to get back. They took what they had, and off we went. So you go off, and do you know what the next place you go to is? Yes. Bastogne, Belgium. Okay. We were trucked, we were put on trucks, and we drove straight through to, to this spot outside of Bastogne, somewhere in the countryside. And they put us, to, they put us out of the trucks, and the trucks turned around and went back immediately. And there we were. <laughs> I don't think anybody knew where we were, but so, that was as close as they could get, so they just put us up. So when you arrived at Bastogne, at Bastogne in Belgium, was there any orders that you were given where y'all were supposed to head to in Bastogne? No. No, not that I know of. I just followed the leader. Whoever was leading, I followed. So at this time, you're, you're looking at probably early December, early to mid-December? We were committed uh, right around the 15th. We received uh, the notification to, we'd have a 24 hours to get ready, somewhere around the 15th of December. And the, at this point, the Germans are making a line and making a push towards trying to break... Absolutely. ...break Allied lines. They had broken through. They had captured and 
destroyed two or three American divisions, and they were well on their way. They were driving for the coast, for the channel. And they were aiming for a small little port in Belgium mm -hmm. that they knew that if they could stop, they could <clears throat> kind of starve y'all out. This small town of, of Bastogne actually was a road junction for several roads, and this is why they needed that spot, because they were, they were trying to move their offensive very fast, and they needed to move it fast. Yeah, they were trying to do their and, blitzkrieg. And, and we, uh, we happened to get right in front of them. Okay. So, did, do you remember the sounds of gunfire? Yes. Do you remember what you were doing, what the orders were, when the Germans finally came into Bastion? They never came into Bastion. They came up against it and separated and went around it, both sides. Okay, so they encircled you? Yes. Did y'all set up a perimeter? Well, that's the duty of the Airborne Division, is to jump behind the enemy lines and set up a perimeter, okay. you know? So it wasn't anything out of the ordinary as far as the attack. We were, we were more in a defensive uh, mode than we were offensive at that time. Were you fighting from houses, or did you set up barricades yourselves? We had foxholes and slit trenches where I was at. Some were located in houses, some were located in some defenses that had been set up with uh, a few armor that had drifted into the area. Okay. Well, on December 22nd, the brigadier commander received a letter from the German commander at the time. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the letter said? Well, it asked for, said, you know, that it was, you're surrounded. And in effect, we don't want to kill you if you give up. Otherwise, we'll destroy you. To that effect. Yes. Uh, the act, had, did you ever get to read the letter yourself or no? No, no, no. It was printed, I think, in, uh, later in the Stars and Stripes. So you were in the Siege of Bastion, and the German commander sent a note to there, and I'll read the note to you, and tell me how, exactly how you felt at the time. The German commander sent, there is only one possibility to save the encircled U.S. troops from total annihilation. This is honorable surrender of the encircled town. In order to think it over, a term of two hours will be granted beginning with the presentation of this note. Well, when I heard about it, there was one thought that, that crossed my mind when I heard that, that General, Brigadier General McAuliffe had answered the Germans with his reply, which as you know was one word. And I thought to myself, General, you must be crazy. What, what was the one word? Nuts. I said, you must be crazy. Are you trying to get these people mad with us? I believe they're already mad with us. And I just shook my head. I, I just, I couldn't conceive of anybody making a reply like that. Now, but, how, with the fighting, was it any different from before the message was sent to after the message was sent? I don't think so. It, it, uh, it naturally might have picked up a little more. Do you think uh, 
originally they were kind of poking around seeing if there's any weaknesses beforehand? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, they always uh, are doing that because they were on the offensive and the offense does that all the time. Now, my next question is, during the siege, your orders were to most likely protect the artillery that's near you and to save and kind of keep the town. Well, I was located at, at uh, right on the outer edge of the town. Our defensive positions were in the part of the town. I'm talking about the company I was with. So you were stationed outside of the outside of Bastion, and you were kind of told to keep the town. Well, we knew there was no retreating. We were, we were surrounded. We knew there was no, no retreating. It was a fight to the finish. Do you know what the odds were for the U.S. against the Germans at that time? I imagine it would have been right high, but I don't know. Uh, estimates were five, for every five Germans, there was one U.S. soldier. Well, <clears throat> it's amazing how things turn out in battle. I can tell you it doesn't go the way you plan it. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, there's a lot of innovations that have to be made to keep something going. It changes, all, it changes fast. Now you say, for instance, uh, uh, artillery. We had no artillery. An, air uh, an airborne division has, uh, has, has very little armor and that would be what the glider troops might bring in. But very, very little. We did have the only thing that I saw in our area the whole time was one 57 millimeter anti tank gun. And it, it had a good crew. There were, there were occasionally TDs, tank destroyers, that had got trapped in the circle with us, that they could uh, deploy one spot to the other to try to provide some type of armor. Uh, I don't know of any artillery I think, I think the Germans had all the artillery. They had plenty of it. Okay. So how was the fighting in there? Was, was it tough? Was it hard? Just existing with the weather was, was a, about as much as a human being could take. Was it cold? Cold. I think the first night we were there, it snowed. It had not snowed up until then. But I think the first night we were there, it snowed. And of course, it was very foggy. It was, the weather was terrible. Uh, you, had, you had little or no air cover. The, and that went against the Germans, though, just as much as it did us because those heavy tanks bogged down or 
slowed down uh, quite often from it. Okay. Now, during the fighting, were you, were you or anyone on your squad or team hit? Yes. <clears throat> Who was that? Pardon? Who ended up getting hit? I believe the, I believe the uh, squad that I was in probably had casualties of close to 100% because if you, if you weren't a casualty of the weaponry, the weather would get you. I remember sleeping in the foxholes and your, your boot and we were wearing combat boots at the time, and those those boots, we had straw down in the in the hole, trying to use it as insulation. But your foot would end up with your toe right straight into an icy wall on your on the foxhole every time. You'd end up with your feet frozen, and the next day you'd have to spend a little time thawing out. And if if the attack came, it would come in early morning. Uh, when the snow with the snow on the ground, you had snow blindness. And a German in a white coverall would be hard to pick up at 100 yards. So were you at ever all injured during the, during the siege? Were you ever hit with like a bullet or shrapnel? No, I was not hit with bullet or shrapnel. Uh, the opportunity to be hit by a bullet or shrapnel, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't understand how I missed it, but somehow I missed it. Okay. Do you know how long y'all had to wait until the siege was over, until y'all got reinforcements? Uh, no, when, when, the, when, when General Patton broke through the, the German lines, the German lines were pulling out because they knew they had to get them out, they had to get out or be trapped themselves. And so they pulled back, and then uh, immediately what troops were left were put together and put on offensive. Did you end up following General Patton, or were you no. stationed somewhere else after? No, the I was a, I was a ca casualty, and I was taken to a hospital. Which hospital was that? I really don't know. It was in uh, in northern France, but I don't remember where. What What were you casually of? What were Were you hit by something? Were you sick? no, just frozen feet. Ah, okay. Uh, my feet. <clears throat> I pulled my boots off one night and uh, got in the sleeping bag, and we were inside a building. First time we we. We're going to sleep in a building mm -hmm. on the floor, and woke up the next morning and tried to put my boots back on, and I couldn't get them. And my feet were swollen 
to a point I couldn't. I think I was wearing three pair of socks, one summer underwear, two long handle underwear, uh, combat pants, shirt, jacket, overcoat, wristlings, uh, gloves, and I couldn't overcome that happening to me. Why do you say you couldn't? Why you well, were upset by that? <clears throat> Under the circumstance and the conditions, I, I thought we did the best we could to fight against that coal. But there was thousands that had to be evacuated because of that. So when you end up going to the hospital for being cold and they treat you, what happened to you right after the hospital? Well, the first thing they did when we when we got out of the ambulance was to strip you of all that clothes, dirty, filthy clothes. This, this, this place that we were at, we didn't stay there but a few days. Then they put us on a train with nothing but frozen casualties, and we went to the, back to the English Channel to go to England for rehab. And I remember getting on the train for a few moments. I have very little recollection at this time I don't know if they gave me something to keep me from remembering or what. But we went, I remember getting on the boat, a small excursion type boat that they use just for crossing the channel. But I don't remember getting on a train once I got across. And I don't remember where they took me. Uh, eventually, I knew I was in Birmingham, England, which is completely across from the English Channel to the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. I, I stayed there, must have stayed there about 60 days. I have no recollection. I do remember the first recollection I had was meeting a, a, boy, a man from Lake City, Leo Harrell. I saw him walking down the company street ahead, uh, coming toward me. And I said, I know that person. And that's who it was, Leo Harrell. I remember pulling guard one time, but that's all I ever remember about this place. I don't know how or what kind of rehab I had. I don't know what kind of meals, where did I eat. I have no recollection. I was shipped back to the division. While I was in rehab, the division was employed in a defensive position along the river between France and Germany. But they had been pulled back from that uh, defense. And when I joined them, I, I was just amazed that I knew absolutely no one. I, I had no idea. All the people that I knew were, were gone. 
So then we were put on trucks again to follow the armored units through southern Germany into Austria, into the area, that mountainous area, the Alps, I guess it's part of the Alps. And we were doing nothing but riding all day long. We couldn't, we, we did not see the armor because it was moving as many miles as it could move in one day. We were just trying to keep up because everything was falling apart. They had every motor, motorized vehicle the Army had carrying troops like that. We had, we had part of our transportation was a, one of these Army ducks, they call them, that can go into a river, across a river, lake. We just rode in anything that had wheels. And the war, all of a sudden, was over. And we began to see German troops marching back without weapons. We traveled into Birch's Garden. Our, our, our division was to be Army of Occupation then, starting in Birch's Garden and extending on into Austria. Birch's Garden is where Hitler had his home on top of a ball mountain. I think it was called Eagle's Nest. I know they said I never seen it or went, or went up to it. I saw it from a distance. Were you under any other types of orders that, during the end of the war? The only orders we had was to uh, be a, an army of occupation. Now, every, the corps that we belonged to, who was responsible for feeding us or keeping supplies for us, those, uh, there was a lot of changes made then. And we actually had to go without food provided by the Army for several days. I remember one time they killed a cow and the cooks cooked it. And you'd get in line and go through and they'd give you a little portion of food, whatever they had, whatever they could put together. And then you'd go out and come right back in on the line to try to get a second helping. But of course, there was no danger from the enemy at that time. We were stationed in a little town called Utendorf, U-T-T-E-N-D-O-R-F. And we stayed there probably 60 days. Then we were shipped back to France. When you got shipped back to France, were you... Was anything else happening? Well, the reason we were shipped back was to get ready to, to be shipped to the Asiatic Theater of Operation. It was still going on. And of course, while we were there, the war ended. 
in uh, both Europe and Asia. So then everything was centered around getting home. And they set up a system of points. And if the highest points went home first. How high were you within the point system? Pardon? How high were you in the point system? Low. Low. I didn't. I didn't. I don't think I. I had any uh, position as far as priority. And what rank were you at the time when the war ended? At the time the war ended, the uh, Asiatic War. Uh, I was a buck sergeant, three stripes. So when the war ended and you finally were shipped back home, how were you treated by not only the French, but your other soldiers as well as people coming home? Well, the French gave us what uh, a, a commendation called uh, the Guerre de France or something like that. It was, a, it was a rope thing around your sh shoulder, I know, with some things on it. They treated us fine. They even gave us uh, the difference between the American dollar and the French franc. We had not been treated fairly on that, and the French came up and reimbursed us on that. And I think, I think uh, both of those were outstanding gestures on their part. I'd, I'd like to insert for just a moment, if, you, if I might, something that I bypassed. Sure, go ahead, sir. Going through the southern part of Germany in the Black Forest, one day we had stopped for some reason, and a Hitler Youth kid came up to me and wanted to swap a pistol for some either candy or chewing gum or anything I had, I guess, cigarette, what have you. So I said, okay, and I, and I followed him, and he went up into the hills maybe a half mile or so away. And he stopped and he dug into ground and came up with a, a P-38, German P-38, which is a replica of the Luger. Still in Cosmoline. The case, the gun, everything was, had never been used perfectly new. When I cleaned it up, the bore was as clean as a pin. You couldn't ask for anything better. Well, at that time, I had about 10 or 12 pistols of different kinds and sizes. So I decided I'd sell all I had, but the, because there was a lot of people looking for souvenirs. So I sold all I had but the P-38. I tried to get it back home, but they finally trapped me, and I either had to give it up or, or, or give, be busted. And giving it up, I would place it in a box with the company supply sergeant, and it would come home under those conditions. Well, one of the high point men went in to get his pistol, so the supply sergeant said, well, I just tell him, there's the box, go ahead and get yours. Well, somebody got mine, and I was left with nothing. Now, I was very disappointed over that. Oh, I, I bet you I were. I was very disappointed over that. Well, when you got home, were you 
How were you treated when you got shipped back over? Oh, we had a parade. It was called VE, VE Day, Victory Parade. We marched down Fifth Avenue for about, I'm going to guess, 80 blocks. And then walked all the way back to the, to the river at the dock, 2nd Street, I think it is. We were stationed. They brought us in on the Queen Mary. In fact, I came home on the Queen Mary again. We had one of those Atlantic storms. Now, this is January, uh, in the area of January to, to 10 or 12, somewhere right in that area. And when they brought us back on the Queen Mary, we were taken to a, something like Camp Shanks, New York, which is close by. And they brought us by train back to the Hudson River, and we got on the ferry, and uh, they ferried us over to Second Street, and that's where we made up the, the parade. Started on about Second Street. Okay. Was there any special things that happened to you? Did you receive any medals, any awards for your service? Uh, the only medal, uh, the only award I got was the Purple Heart. And on the back of the Purple Heart, I was surprised to see that it had my name on it, Zola Godwin. And the next surprise I got was when I was uh, discharged in Augusta, Georgia at the fort down there. I can't remember it. They gave me another one. I said, what's this one for? He says, well, we just, we got some left over and we're giving them out to the ones who have a Purple Heart so that you'll have two. You might lose one. That was it. When you got back from the war, how were you perceived? Well, everybody was glad to see me, but uh, it wasn't any kind of uh, victory parade. You talking about Lake City? Yeah. Yes, sir. Lake City. It was just... Another day, and uh, people, people were friendly. They treated me f fine. I talked to some of the people in town, different ones, about what I should do about my education. I was concerned then about my education because the GI Bill of Rights was uh, something that was coming into effect. And I was eligible at that time for 36 months of college education. That would have covered four, four years. And I knew some of the courses that I took in high school, like <clears throat> uh, the farming courses that I probably should, would have to have something a little stronger than that to go to college. And I wasn't that strong in English anyway. I, I, I thought I did fairly well in mathematics, but I talked to several people and they thought maybe my best opportunity would be to go to a technical school. And I was interested in electricity anyway because I'd helped my father wire 
the farmhouses, when the Santee Electric came into effect. So I'd had a little bit of electrical training, and I thought maybe that might be a good way to go. So I finally ended up going to Coin Electrical School in Chicago, Illinois. The course was only about seven months, but it was during the wintertime and early spring. That must have been the second coldest place in the world I'd ever been. I, never, I, I couldn't believe how cold it was. So I, I took the electrical course there and also I was introduced to radio and some electronics. They had, a, they had a little bit of electronics back, back in those days. I came back to Lake City and went to work with uh, electrical contractors. I did work for several of them, and then I settled with uh, Edward Diggs. I don't know, I see, we, I stayed with him until Wentworth Manufacturing Company came to Lake City. And we were wiring the old W. Lee Flowers warehouse right behind Main Street for them to use as a training area. And in the process, <clears throat> they hired all of us all of Ed and all, and all the men that worked for him to be either sewing machine mechanics, learn how to be a sewing machine mechanic, or do electrical work, air condition, stuff like that. In being a, a sewing machine mechanic, I found it fairly easy to learn to sew, and I, and I like sewing with, with machines. And in the process, I learned to be a, a supervisor. And they opened the plant, they opened the plant Wentworth did in Florence for blacks only and asked me to be a part of that, and I accepted. And the training I got there just kind of moved me along. And I got into the area of management and uh, supervising, managing. After quite a few years of that, I decided I would buy into a young sewing plant that was beginning over in Florence. And it was, uh, had been started by my brother-in-law, Jimmy Yop, Yop Manufacturing. It was a very small place at the time, but I bought stock in it and went to work there. Then I took about a year vacation from there and came back to Wentworth and worked for Charlie Slotnick on the stitching room floor for a year. Then I went back to Yacht Manufacturing Company. We were bought out, 90% of our stock was bought out by a company out of Ashbury, North Carolina, Acton McCrary Corporation. They were big in women's hose, hosiery. And they built us a new plant. 
And they kept enlarging it until we had over 600 employees out at the airport. Uh, right on the east side of the airport. Behind the fairgrounds, they call it. it. used to be the county fairgrounds. I stayed there for until all the old folks either died away or were <clears throat> retired. The new, the new management came in. Now, at the time, I was director of, of uh, research and development for Marlow Manufacturing Company. The name was changed from Yop to Marlow Manufacturing Company. Six, over 600 employees. I don't know how many years I stayed there. It was up until 82. Yeah, 82. And I was, uh, I wasn't fired, but I was released. New management came in. Big ideas. Not only was I let go, but the company manager and his wife, quite a few others. They, they, so to speak, they cleaned the house. I went to work for Yacht Manufacturing Company again for two years then I started my own plant Godwin Manufacturing Company from 84 to about 95 I, I ran it I kept it open and ran it best thing that ever happened to me of course I had a heart attack and all kind of problems during that time because I was getting, getting up in years. But the people in Lake City always treated me good. Well, let me ask you this. In what year did you get married? And who did you marry? Okay, I got married in 1948. Uh, Mill V. Godwin, no, Mill V. Pridgen, P-R-I-D-G-E-N. Her folks were with the railroad shop over in Florence. She had brothers, and all the brothers worked on the railroad at one time or other. One was an engineer. One was a, a hmm, I don't know what you call the other. One of them worked in the shop. Nineteen forty-eight. Did you have any children? Yes, we had two boys, and we adopted a girl. Okay. Um, do you have any in in touch with other veterans? You know, after the war. After the war, I served in the South Carolina National Guard for four years as a, as a first sergeant. I was even given the opportunity to go to officer training, OCS, and after we got it started, they ran out of money. So that ended that. The guard was not as strong financially in those days as they probably are today. In reflection of your life, Mr. Brooks, how can you sum up your life? 
when I'm sitting here today in front of you and talking about my life, this is probably the greatest opportunity or one of the greatest opportunities that I've experienced in my life. To think at my age, I would be sitting here today trying to retell and relive a lot of my life. There, there were times that I had to turn over my life to someone else. Things were that bad. There were times in my life that things were so good, just like you honoring me here today, or just like the honor flight and what it did to bring recognition just beyond words. To think that somebody like me, you know, brought up on a farm and no tractor, the implements in those days were horses or mules, and that was it. And be given the opportunity, and I hate to say it that way, to, to get out of that type of condition. Here you are, here we're, we've left a depression, a, a time when things were very, very bad. This was poor country. When I left to go into service, this was poor country. Everywhere you looked and everywhere you went, the only way you could describe it would be poor. I, I guess 95% of the people would be on food stamps with today's requirements. And we were brought up on the meagerest types of, of nutrition. I don't think my body fully developed until after my and around my 19th birthday. I think I, I was overseas at the time and I I only weighed about 144 pounds up until then. And my body grew up to 182 pounds. And I think I grew taller. I don't think I had had a, a good enough nutrition in my lifetime for my body to fully develop. But I've, I've lived through that. I lived to see those changes. I was, I was fortunate to know that there was an almighty God early in my life. I knew about God. I knew about Jesus. I'd heard many, many people pray. I'd been around prayer probably more than anything else because the country at that time needed prayer. And, it, and when it came time, for me to pray for my life 
I had no problem. I had no problem. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Mr. Brooks.